Quickly, these are my disclosures. Uh, I'm talking about the guidelines for you know, stable ischemic heart disease, so none of them should be relevant to this. Uh, basically, these are slides that are adapted from the 2012 guidelines, and they were modified in 2014, so if you needed to go back, you can look at these, and it should give you a pretty comprehensive uh, thing of what it is. Um, so I'm just going to go skip through all of these things. So the first thing here, one of the key messages in the guideline is that a good proportion, there's a very small proportion of individuals who are going to be in the category of CAD that benefit, have a survival benefit, say, for example, left main. Okay, it's a very small proportion, proportion of individuals are going to fall in that category. So most of your individuals, starting with medical therapy, is what is recommended by the guidelines. So a patient comes to you with chest pain, you do a stress test, or you, you think this patient, patient has coronary artery disease. Your first line is always going to be medical therapy because it's going to be a very small proportion of individuals who have significant CAD where survival benefit is going to be there. Remember, the only thing that's shown survival benefit over medicines is you know, coronary artery bypass grafting, but this is based on data in the 70s and 80s where you didn't have aspirin, statins, or anything else. And there's PCI, as you know, there's not been any, uh, we're not talking about acute coronary syndrome, so this is stable ischemic heart disease. So in stable ischemic heart disease, the benefit of PCI as far as survival benefit has not yet been established, and you know, head-to-head -head between in cabbage and uh, PCI, you know the, the, the data as far as that goes. So most patients should undergo a trial of guideline man, you know, directed management before medical therapy, before consideration of revascularization. Delaying a revascularization is not associated with worse outcomes. That's another key point that you have to remember. And then they also say that prior to going for revascularization, it's reasonable to know what you're going after. In other words, where is the functional deficit based on a stress test? Because that's where you want to try to go revascularize. Because you go and do a cath, you find, find two, three blockages, which are you know 70%, which one do you try to tackle first? And that's where a functional test may be of value. Uh, patients with you know, uh, uh, stable ischemic heart disease should also be carefully monitored. These are the key guideline messages that come through. Uh, so if you look at the spectrum of medical management itself, these are things that are very familiar to you. Cigarette smoking, blood pressure control, lipid management, physical activity, weight management, and diabetes. Antiplatelet therapy, you know, ACE inhibitors, so on and so forth, beta blockers. And things that we're not attuned to are things like immunization, talking to your patient about depression. So I'll try to highlight those and not tell too much time on things that I expect you to know already uh, in, in these things. So one of the big key emphasis that's been placed in the 2014 guidelines is actually patient education. When you, an informed patient is a better partner for you in taking care of their own health and it will help you get you know, uh, better results. Talking to your patient about pathophysiology of disease, why you're putting them on medications, what to expect with the medications will help the patient with compliance and also there's a buy-in from the patient and you'll be able to actually uh, uh, make inroads with them. So this was, you can see uh, several, you know, grade one recommendations for that. Talking to the patient about medication adherence, explaining to them about their options, explaining to them about um, uh, what the risk reduction strategies are. All of these are critical components of it, description of what physical activity is, what's an optimal weight, how do you monitor yourself, when do you go to the emergency room. These are kind of things that are going to come up in performance metrics for you down the line as to whether you're doing these things and all that. So it's important for you to start incorporating it right now when you're starting to you know, go into your practice of uh, 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 cardiology. Um, so again, these just talk to you about all of those. Now quickly slipping on to the guideline directed medical therapy. Lipid management, when these guidelines came about, they suggested other than lifestyle modification and diet, remember dietary component of it is an important thing about total percentage of fats that you would have, uh, which is less than 7% of their total calories for saturated fats. Now, the other, as far as the basic medication management itself goes, remember statins are still the front and center of your uh, 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 management of uh, lipids. Now, when these guidelines were written, they had these goals of 100 milligrams per deciliter for uh, you know, uh, less than 100 milligrams in the LDL and less than 70 as an optional. But since then, you know from the 2013, there's been a new lipid guidelines and we'll talk briefly about that. One thing I want to point out over here is here you see for those who do not tolerate statins, bile acid resins and niacin may be reasonable. Now with the latest guidelines, niacin has fallen off because the addition on top of statins has not shown to be a benefit potential harm uh, even, uh, mainly no benefit. So now ezetimibi would be the second line agent because it's shown you know, addition, uh, additional value on top of statins. So there's a slight change based on what these guidelines are. 
Now, the lipid guidelines that came out in 2013 kind of simplified it. I'm going to only focus on uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease includes all your CHD, strokes, and any atherosclerotic lesion greater than 50%. All of them will count towards atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If you have that, you need to be on a high-intensity statin if you can tolerate it. If you're in between the ages of, you know, above 21 years of age and up to 75. Older individuals may have a slightly higher side effect profile with statins, so you just want to watch it. It's not that you cannot go to high-intensity statin therapy, you just do it a little bit more watchful. Now, what is high-intensity statin therapy? Anything that reduces your LDL cholesterol by 50%. Okay, there are several, if you look at what we have available from statins right now, there are two medications that can do it. Resuvastatin 20 to 40 milligrams and atorvastatin 40 to 80. So for all practical purposes, any of your patient with CAD of any sort, you're going to try to target towards this. One of the questions that you get frequently asked is, what if their LDL is 80? Okay, so what is 50% of 80? You still get down to 40. Now, what the guidelines also tell you is you can continue the LDL to drive the LDL cholesterol down, and only when it's less than 40 on two consecutive readings, that's when you can back off on the medications to see, you know, where you want. We still don't know what an optimal LDL cholesterol is. It's being evolved, it's being studied more. You know, there are newer, uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors with those studies, we're seeing LDLs in the 20s and 30s. There is a downside with a slightly higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage with these things. So we don't know what the optimal thing is. But even at less than 40, your brain function and everything seems to be just doing fine. So you don't have to fear it. So you can start your individuals with 40 to you know, 80 of Atorva or 20 to 40 of Resuvastatin. The other thing to note is, since then there's been an update to the lipid guidelines where they've added a secondary target. This is not a guideline but more of a recommendation where they've added a secondary target of less than 70. In other words, if you start your individual patient on high intensity statin and the LDL comes back at 90, do you need to do anything? Now that you have an additional agent from example azetamibi which has shown additional benefit on top of a statin, the guidelines now suggest you can add a secondary target of less than 70 also. So in those individuals you will try intensifying therapy a little bit more. Now, blood pressure management, I'm not going to go over in great detail, but you know, you know, it's horses for courses. If you have, atri you know, if you have a, a heart failure, you add ACE inhibitors uh, and beta blockers. So those are basically, you know, general blood pressure management strategies. Here they talk about 140 over 90. Don't forget uh, uh, um, lifestyle modification. A good diet and lifestyle changes will give you 10 to 20 millimeters of blood pressure reduction, while on average, each medication gives you 10 millimeters of blood pressure reduction. So it's better than one medication. So do not forget to emphasize the DASH diet as far as that goes. Diabetes management, nothing to write home about. As far as cardiovascular disease endpoint management goes, it's just that it's useful to get a hemoglobin A1C 7 or less, and in people who are not able to tolerate the things, 7 to 9 percent is okay. The only thing you want to remember from a cardiology perspective is therapy with rosiglitazone should not be initiated because of the risk of heart failure. So that is a class 3 uh, uh, in people, people with stable ischemic heart disease. So to advise that, that's the only thing, you know, a key point that will stick out there. Antiplatelet therapy. Aspirin and in or uh, clopidogrel, either one of them are reasonable. 81 to 162, 75 to 162, or 81 to 162 milligrams on the aspirin. And clopidogrel in those who are not able to tolerate um, aspirin. Uh, the combination may be reasonable in you know, high risk individuals, but the benefit is not clear. Diperidamol is not recommended. Now, beta blocker therapy, you know, with heart failure. The one thing I want to point out is the guideline for people who've had an MI. Beta blocker therapy should be started and continued for three years in all patients with normal LV function after MI or ACS. We all know for heart failure, but this is the duration of this three years after an ACS, uh, you know, may not be as apparent, so I'll point that out to you as far as that goes. Um, as far as ACE inhibitors go, again, you know with heart failure, it's going to be indicated less than 40%, and anybody with diabetes, CKD, uh, will also benefit from uh, ACE inhibitors, so that should be uh, in your uh, uh, patients with that. Smoking cessation is front and center. There are clear, well-defined algorithms where you are actually asked to talk to your patient about it, ask and document their tobacco status use. If they're recent quitters, congratulate them. If not, give them uh, uh, reasons why to quit, and this is every visit. And 
encourage them, help them facilitate a stop date, tell them what to expect, weight gain, you know, uh, becoming crabby when they're starting, stopping smoking and things like that, and try to help them and facilitate them. You also have to talk about medications that can be used as smoking cessation aids, and this is part of what we will need to do. Physical activity, what's encouraged is 30 to 60 minutes, five to seven days a week, if possible, every day of the week. Adding some resistance training at least two days a, two days a week is also reasonable. And these are not anything uh, uh, that should be new to you. Weight management, you know what the optimal BMI is, 18 to 25. The initial goal should be 5 to 10% weight loss because with that, you can achieve a lot of changes in their uh, um, basic metabolic profile, your, your glucose tolerance and lipids and all of that. The 10% weight loss is all that you need. Um, now, quickly stepping on to treatment for angina. The first line for angina treatment is beta blockers, not nitrates as you think. The first line is beta blockers. And in individuals who are not, you, who don't, you don't control angina with the beta blockers, you can consider adding a calcium channel blocker or a nitroglycerin. Or if they're not able to tolerate a beta blocker, addition of calcium channel blockers and nitroglycerin will be reasonable. In those who need additional agent or additional treatment, renalazine can be useful as a substitute for beta blockers or in addition with beta blockers. With renalazine, just watch the QT interval. That's something that you should know, and so that's, it's, it's something that can prolong it. Um, don't forget to manage the other parts of it. Depression has been associated with worse outcomes in every disease state, including CHD and heart failure. We don't know if treating it is going to make an impact, but at least if you identify it, you know, at least make sure they have the appropriate uh, uh, screening and counseling for that. Alcohol, what is okay, you know, for non-pregnant women, one drink per day, and men, one or two drinks per day is reasonable. Anything more, you should, you know, again, guide them. Avoiding air pollution makes sense. Influenza vaccination, don't forget that. An annual vaccination and being up to date with that is an important thing. Because remember, people with flu die from uh, coronary uh, 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 complications. Quick, quick notes on additional uh, uh, therapy. Uh, there are several things that are being looked at. Chelation is a 2B. There's still actually a randomized study that's going on. Estrogen, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin B12, none of them have any benefit. Coenzyme Q10, again, no benefit from uh, ischemic heart disease itself. This is just the algorithm we all discussed, so I'm going to flip through this. If you still have refractory angina, Ex, you know, uh, external counterpulsation therapy may be a possibility. Spinal cord stimulation may be a possibility. Uh, Transmyocardial revascularization may be a possibility. All of these to help with angina. Acupuncture has not shown any benefit, and it's actually a class three. Okay, with that, I'll stop and let Dr. Lin talk. Thank you.